I could do full back. I could buy back directly. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I've, I've taken the LA to Sydney flight a couple of times. Mm. It's um, it's a long time to be in in an airplane. It's like sixteen hours, only. Yeah, yeah. I think it's seventeen and a half going from LA to Sydney. Yeah. Yeah, the one who's from. From New York to Singapore, it's like 22 or 24 hours. Yeah. Well, but, but that's the blessing of COVID, right? We don't have to fly that much. Yeah. <laughs> William Bao B wants the mic. Do we give him the mic? Yeah, yeah. How do I do that? It showed up. William? He, he should just be able to join. I, I, he can just click the button. William can hear us if we just click the button and uh, and join. I think he... Yes, and Mike beyond Kartia. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, Ikram. How are you? Good, how are you? Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. What, what time is it now in Pakistan? Pakistan, it is 4.15. Okay. Well, so exactly 12 hours from where I am in LA. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's time, I think. Uh, it will be probably, uh, it'll probably be 12 hours if it's from LA. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? It will be probably 12 hours if it's from LA. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be No. <clears throat> so, no, no, no. Wait for me. Either is you can make it. You can make it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Um, Ikram will probably start in a few minutes. Um, okay, good. Are you ready, Ikram? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. can yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, well, welcome. Um, uh, welcome, William. And um, welcome, everyone, to the panel. Um, now, um, now, as we all know, um, the Belton Road is quite a mouthful. Is it, it could also mean the New Silk Roads. Um, the 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 belt is the road, and the road is some nar maritime route. And um, I think it's got you no know, um, different uh, perception of the world, where you no know, is is raised by some developing countries, but it's 
is being uh, viewed with you now suspicions and apprehension by some you now developed countries. Uh, that trap or you now is a you know, expansionless uh, program of China and so on. So maybe we can uh, start with it, you know, from your point of view, which is you know, a immediate neighbor of um, of China, Pakistan, and uh, I think uh, quite a lot of investments in the BRI you know, is unfolding in your country. And um, I don't know, you know from your perspective, do you see the BRI as something you know, both good, bad, and different, both good, bad at the same time? How do you see BRI from your perspective? Equally? Well, I think this is the best thing that's ever happened to Eurasia. Actually, because um, you know, uh, I can't think of a better way to develop uh, regions which are undeve- underdeveloped, uh, underpopulated at flat places, uh, and pe- and uh, uh, regions which have uh, overpopulation, but yet there are regions which are totally without population. So, if you want to develop it, you have to go back to the time when the American West was developed. You know how it was developed. It was. It was. You, you can't at that point. There were no. Uh, there were no. Um, you know. Let us say. Uh, motor cars. There were only railway engines. So, so railway engines was the, was the major thing that developed it at that time. You know the the railroads developed the American West. So that's my view, basically. And uh, you want me to continue, or you want me to? I just 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 ask me a question. Um, now, um, I, I'm sure that it has benefited some you know, business people in Pakistan, but um, has the benefits flow through to the general population, or or no, it's really you now being being the the benefits are really flowing, you no, know, uh, quite differentially that. Some businessmen are winning, but now the the general population you know, may may not you know, may may not benefit as much from the program. In fact, every uh, segment of the population is benefiting. First of all, it is going through uh, the vastly underdeveloped areas of Balochistan and of uh, frontier, right? Which uh, could never hope for roads or railways or anything of the sort, right? So you will definitely, as this goes up, the new Growth, urban growth will grow up along this railway lines mostly, and then the existing places will already have this thing. But because of the uh, movement of freight and goods and population, it is basically um, helping the entire population of Pakistan in one way or the other. Whether it's uh, whether it's, and I'm I'm telling you even even as far as education is concerned, some of the uh, places could never even hope for education. Why couldn't they hope for education? Because well, the teachers wouldn't go out there, right? Now, the teachers wouldn't. Why wouldn't they go out there? Because there was no communication there. Now, now with the communication there, uh, you know, uh, means of transportation there, right? And uh, let us talk about medical care. Let us talk about other things, right? So, vast market. And I think one of the major things which uh, we, we are people, there's a lot of uh, let us say um, fake news about it being put around. Is the debt trap? You know, that's nonsense, total nonsense. Out of the 50, 46 million dollars that have come in, 26, uh, 26 billion dollars that have come in, uh, 26 billion dollars is towards power projects. Power projects pay by itself. It is not to the government of Pakistan, not to the thing. It is uh, uh, private uh, public partnerships and the power projects, uh, as they earn money because of the energy, uh, this thing, they will, earn, they will pay off the, this thing. So there's not a sovereign debt as such. As for the power project, there is uh, about seven or eight million billion dollars, which is uh, let us say, and those are at excellent terms. Uh, there are terms which you know, which uh, which really are uh, terms which uh, which are which one would not expect. Uh, uh, you know, using far less than normal commercial terms. So I do not know about other countries, and I cannot comment because I hear a lot in these things. But as far as Pakistan is concerned. Uh, we are very, very lucky to have it. I'm uh, especially, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm especially a lot of sort of, uh, let us say, excited about it because, um, um, you know, I 
have a 50 years um, um, experience with this. And I was a skeptic at, when, I, when it started. I mean, really, when, when actually the Karakuram Highway started, which is the first part of this thing. I was actually a helicopter pilot attached to the People's Liberation Army because the People's Liberation Army did not have helicopters, right? And I was saying, where the hell is this road going? <laughs> it's going from nowhere to nowhere, right? There was no bother at that time. There was Karachi, right? And I really used to be very, this thing, I said, I didn't feel, I was saying, okay, fine, it's a good road. Crosses the mountains, affect our people, you know, everything. But really, I didn't think it had uh, any economic uh, this thing about it. And I used to express it as a young officer. I used to say that. But now I look back on it, and I want to quote my my interpreter at that time. Uh, my interpreter at that time, you know, I I told him my I said, you know, you Chinese are stupid. Why are you making this road? You know, you you're dying. You know, because people are dying on this road. Uh, you know, at that point in time, there were no of those now high tech sort of uh, uh, bulldozers or tractors or something like that. And we were, you know, they were putting holes in and exploding the rocks, etc. And people were getting injured. And th th there's a whole graveyard of Chinese, you know, one of the places there. So he told me, he said, no, we, uh, you know, you people think in terms of five, ten years, you Pakistanis, you're stupid. We had Chinese think in terms of 50, 100 years. Right. There was no bother at that time. But look at them. The bother has come up. Right. And I, I tell you, frankly, uh, you know, my friend, uh, Mr. Chow of Zeng Lai, went on and that was 1970, uh, 1970. In 2003, he became the ambassador of China to Pakistan. Right. And every year now he rings me up. And one first conversation is he says, who's stupid? You know. Right. So frankly speaking, I learned a lot. And I, I tell you one thing, um, and not only for Pakistan, but for the region. I, I was there in Gwadar only about maybe two weeks ago. And I went up to the Iranian border. And you cannot imagine. Uh, I mean, I could not imagine the traffic that was there. You know, they already. Right? And I even go, because of the pandemic, the port has slowed down, uh, quite circumstantial. But you could see, you know, for example, Aramco is making the world's biggest refinery there in George mm -hmm. Gwadar. Right? So, Somebody, somebody's got something. When they make the big refinery, there will be uh, uh, growth of, uh, you know, uh, real estate investment there, right? There will be uh, this thing, etc. People are, uh, there, there is the roads, the master plan that have been made by the Chinese, as, as a matter of fact. You know, again, uh, there, there's a lot of growth here, uh, in that area. It will take time. This is not going to happen overnight, right? I think, but uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, etc. But I just want to give you one back. I want to go back to one thing. I was just doing my homework about the BRI, the, because we are we are we are basically a north uh, northeast southwest corridor, right? About the BRI, and you know, you must remember that in our region we had the RCD at once upon a time, the Regional Cooperation of Development, which was a, a economic side of the center. But during that time, there were a lot of roads and railways constructed in this area. Uh, in Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, right? Now, these are all connected already to eco-countries, now, which is Economic Cooperation Organization, which succeeded uh, the RCD, with the result that you already have a network of roads in this area. It doesn't have to be, in many cases, have to be upgraded, right? The trains, I was surprised, to Khorgos, to Khorgos in um, uh, Kazakhstan, there, uh, there have been about 10,000 Chinese trains which have crossed uh, the Khorgos thing. Uh, going back, there have been 5,000 trains because, you know, the Chinese have longer uh, uh, trains because they have maybe about 80 or 85 bogies. The European trains can't take more than 40 or 42 bogies, right? So they have to break up the trains once they cross the border into two trains. But just imagine, 10,000 trains in the last five years have gone through uh, Kargos, and some of them have gone from Shanghai to Paris. So once the North-South Corridor starts off, let me tell you, the BRI is not only going to be stuck to the east-west corridor connecting Eurasia, right? It'll be a north-south corridor from Russia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, down to Shabahar in Iran, and down to Gwadar in Pakistan. Can you imagine that the first time you'd have ports and access on the mainland of Asia? The problem is, the problem is that it is still now only Chinese. You know, it is in, it is important for other European countries are coming into it now, but it is very important for the United States to engage. 
it is very important for the united states to engage because they, they are going to be a net uh, we are uh, uh, these countries are going to be net beneficiaries the united states are going to lose out on that sense because this is on the mainland of uh, of this thing you can have boats you can have uh, uh, you know you can have bases across the gulf in qatar or doha or abu dhabi but that is you have to still cross across the gulf into asia here you have a mainland thing access and that and investment opportunities investment opportunities i think it is uh, you, you just cannot imagine the scope of the investment which has uh, come up every i have been because now my association because of business and beyond because of geopolitical analysis that i do in, uh, in lecture in various uh, you know defense universities but i do see a great economic impact in the entire region it won't be constrained to pakistan or to iran if you want to peace in afghanistan you would have to hit afghanistan with economic means you would have to this is a deprived area there are no economic this thing the only way it can come up economic means is if you have access if you have communications once that access and communication is established you would have energy coming corridors coming through afghanistan and you would have uh, you will have all their resources of mining at uh, which they have plenty of resources that be uh, that could be economically uh, you know sort of mined etc and sent to uh, i see it a great i see a great opportunity. thank you ekam so um while we waiting for uh wait to get back maybe you know we can start with you first william now um i think based on a lot of uh topics that ekam has covered uh of course the bri uh, is at least perceived as being state driven it has geopolitical implications it benefits the resource security of china but from a technology for a startup scene is it is it something too remote the bri this is of any relevance to the startup crowd that you are coaching every day or is it no it's just just a different part of the economy is 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 the state sector that you no know, has limited relevance to what you're working on on a day-to-day basis william Yeah sure so i would say uh can you hear me okay first of all i think it's working yeah, finally right. yeah so a lot of people are having some issues with the platform uh so i the the way i would think about it you know look at india as an example uh so india is a burgeoning market very large market um and uh, the last time i checked uh this is like 2 years ago you know 47 of the top 100 apps in india uh were chinese uh then on top of that uh you had another maybe 25 30 of the top 100 apps uh which is um, chinese money uh chinese tech uh indian local management um and and so uh you you basically have uh, the internet in india which is is really driving a huge amount of change um and this is not government related it's pure commercial um uh, basically being driven by very large uh, uh chinese internet companies alibaba and tencent uh and uh, even within china this sort of a duopoly uh the the chinese government doesn't want just two players in the internet so they're they're tamping um down the the the, the leaders um but uh you 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 have a um i don't know what you call it economic power um but um you know and, and colonization is a very charged word um but you have the the indian internet was dominated by chinese companies so um this is it, it's pre- pretty commercial um and it was not state driven it was uh, corporate driven um but uh, you what we do uh, when we work when we start ups uh, is you know having spent 25 years in china uh, and investing is we teach uh the chinese uh, approaches to business the um you know competitive practices um in from china uh to local entrepreneurs uh all around the world uh and uh mostly southeast asia south asia where number 5 was active bc in asia uh number 8 in asia and number 4 in india uh to the local entrepreneurs on the, on the ground and advise them uh, how they can if they want to uh stay independent um so um if you look at Pakistan Tencent and Alibaba are running their playbook so first thing they do is they go into payment um so uh Tencent Alibaba has a payment platform the second thing they do is go into e-commerce uh Tencent also now has payment uh we're an investor in the number 2 e-commerce platform in Pakistan called Priceoy uh and so 
Um, now, am I going to tell that entrepreneur uh, not to sell uh, to Tencent when they call come calling? Um, no, I mean, so it's up to them. Um, but you should have a choice of whether or not uh, you want to, um, you know, you, you want to uh, come in under that umbrella. Uh, so um, hopefully that gives you some uh, context. Uh, and, uh, you know, last year, um, India made uh, some interesting uh, decisions and then and basically stopped all Chinese apps in, in, in India. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's, I guess, their decision. Uh, I try to stay out of politics. Um, but the Indian entrepreneurs that we work with uh, has done have done like, quite well out of it. Um, and uh, so we're just trying to take advantage of um, what we believe is a, a very difficult situation. You know, it's important uh, to keep things open. Uh, building barriers don't help anybody. Um, but, you know, companies from one country taking over companies from another country don't always, uh, don't always work out well for the target country. So you have to keep that in mind. And I'll, I'll stop talking now. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you, Odin. Um, well, I think that's very insightful and very helpful. That at least now, uh, enlightening me to a broad perspective of what VR is all about. That now, our impression, including you know, including mine, is you now, VR is you now really heavy infrastructure, you no know, rails and roads and so on. And one area that um, uh, I learned that the development world is a world leader more than the developed world, I mean developing world such as you know, China, India and Africa is in the you know, fintech mobile payment because you, we don't have the legacy of credit cards and all that. So um, how do you see you know, um, fintech, what themes in fintech do you see as, a, as weaving through the whole you know, Belt and Roads in, among multiple countries on you know, Belt and Roads? Um, do you want me to take that? Sure. Okay. So, um, you know, the three things are kind of important in order to get uh, populations on the internet. You know, first you have to have a cheap enough device. We have Android, $50 Androids, you know, work pretty well. Uh, the second thing is you need relatively inexpensive or close to free internet. Uh, you don't want to have people uh, thinking every time they log on. Uh, and in India, you've seen that. And in Pakistan, it's not that expensive. And then the third thing uh, is you need to reduce the drag. We call it drag. But basically, you need to make it easy to pay for things. Um, and once you have payment, uh, then, you know, you, you, then you offer things to buy, right? So the, 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 what comes after payment uh, is e-commerce. Um, so the, the, the kind of the way um, the, the, the China playbook is you start with um, – one or two core services, but you need to have payment. And then what you create what's called a super app, uh, which is every single service around it. Um, now, some services are sticky, like media, and then other services make money, like financial services. Um, you keep the user engaged with the sticky service, but the way you make money is with uh, usually, um, you know, fintech, uh, uh, you know, payment, uh, financial products, insurance, and then uh, secondly is uh, e-commerce. Um, so we know the playbook. Uh, so when I started, I engaged with Pakistan, for example, three years ago. I started investing a year ago. Uh, we're just closing our fifth investment. Uh, and we understand the, the China playbook. And so you can, we're positioning ourselves in front of it uh, to, uh, to help catch. Um, so um, hopefully that helps and my network is not stable. So I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. Great, great. Please, Akron, please. You know, I'm very interesting. Uh, if, if you allow me, uh, you know, I, I just want to tell you, 80% of Pakistan's population is without bank accounts. Right? And with the result that uh, the, the state bank has got a financial improvement scheme, right? Which they call, uh, in, in, in Urdu, it is known as Asan Mobile Account. Asan Asan Mobile Account. Right? Which is easy money. Now, what happens is that uh, you know uh, the state bank gives a uh, payment of PSO PSP license uh, to some companies which they give it, and uh, uh, the, uh, the you know the uh, Pakistan Telecommunication Authority, it PTA gives a third party service provider license. Right now, exactly what uh, you're talking about. Let me explain this to you. Now, by some quirk of charge, you raise the subject 
um, my company is the only one which has got both the licenses. Uh, PSO, PSP, and we've got the AMA license. And we are about, uh, we've already got about, um, you know, on a pilot project, we've already got about 370 AMA accounts with the banks. Now, what happens is that uh, 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 if there are 14 uh, banks with digital licenses, they're all connected to us. So you can, on your mobile, you can open an account in less than one minute, right? And then you can pay from the your account uh, exactly what we're talking about, you know, and, and we have not had any problems of any, uh, you know, playbooks from anywhere. This is all Pakistani, right? all Pakistani. We've had, in the sense of uh, the uh, the person can debit his account from the bank and pay anywhere he wants. He has just to, uh, because this is, nothing. he can get a loan for up to almost, uh, which is about $5,000. Uh, so he can get a loan up to $5,000 in Pakistani currency. You can get it, uh, you know, in less than four hours, right? Now you can say, what is the thing? Because when he connects on the telephone, he goes on his ID card, it is Nadra, it, uh, the, which is the government institution, which is got all the ID cards, electronic ID card. So the SIM card is connected to the ID card. So when he opens the account, immediately in the bank, the entire thing appears. That is, Yes, this is his telephone number, this is the thing, this is the ID card number, etc. In case he defaults on the loan, by any chance, he will uh, he will have uh, a, a problem because his ID card will also be blocked. Right? So he cannot afford to be defaulted. So this is a tremendous thing. We are just about uh, actually, well, let us say, we are days away from actually launching it. And like I said, we've already got more than 360,000, 70,000 accounts with various banks. Various banks, 14 banks which are working with us, have got these accounts which are already working. Um, actually, million, million, uh, billions of rupees have already passed by in transactions to these accounts. But the major part of this account also this, this switch is that you can actually remit money uh, through one of the exchange dealers and split. It can come either to the either it can come either to the telephone or it can go to the bank account of the person. Yes, the hey, just uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Winston. Could you just mute? Because uh, it's very hard to hear. There's a lot of feedback. Yeah, right. So, all right. So the the uh, the, the thing is that we we really uh, we really want uh, something which you know we uh, the thing etc. We are already beyond the curve. You know, we are beyond the curve, right? And we have got a lot of uh, people talking to us about collaborating, not in Pakistan alone. We have got uh, I can't name them for the obvious reasons that we've got NDA signed with them. They're thinking of collaborating with us in other countries, uh, you know, because other countries have the same problem. They don't have uh, uh, a lot of unbanked population. Uh, for example, Turkey has got 30% of its population unbanked. Um, uh, 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 other countries have even more. Uh, uh, the thing. Egypt, for example, has got about almost 45% of its population unbanked. So, you know, uh, you know, and this is part of this thing. So some of the technology is coming uh, really uh, from all over the place, right? But mostly we have done it within Pakistan. The, uh, the software, etc., has been developed by us within the Pakistan. Obviously, we've got IBM servers working with us. We've got Oracle. We've got, uh, you know, SAP for the mobile wallet. They mobilize a five uh, onto the, uh, you know, telephones for the mobile wallet. So things are happening. As the economic uh, things are, uh, resurgency is coming, but the Belt and Road Initiative makes a great difference. Because if you've got a payment system already in place by default, then you have a lot of uh, this thing. Actually, actually, frankly speaking, a lot of other companies which have partly come into this, partly come into this, they are all, they are, they are all going to go to the, by the board when this thing happens. Because it's a World Bank initiative. The World Bank invested a lot of money in this. And so has the State Bank of Pakistan. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Akram. So I, I think based on you know, what uh, I've been hearing from you, Akram and Wayne, is if we look at you know, what's been driving the development of China in the early stages is the bamboo network, uh, both you know, Hong Kong Taiwanese businessmen and more broadly overseas Chinese and Southeast Asia investing in China. So there's one network. And then if we look at the more the global innovation network, is the linkage between from certain you know, uh, Indian tech people, 
uh, East Asian tech people and Silicon Valley and then with Israel. So it's another network. So are we seeing you know, uh, the emergence of another type of network that um, either through you know, investment flow, either through the uh, examples people can emulate um, that uh, whereas in the past we see you know, the best and brightest in South Asia, the, the way to make it is you know, leave, leave South Asia and you know, go to Silicon Valley, California and do some startup. But are we seeing a different pattern that based on all the you know, startup in, in China, it inspired people you know, in the regions and through you know, investment flow and through you know, investments in infrastructure and so on. So are we seeing a really flattening or propagation of innovation networks you know, beyond the typical centers of you know, Silicon Valley and Israel to, to a, a broader base of innovations you know, throughout you know, Eurasia? Did, are we seeing that? Either one of you, William, or Akram, or Wayne. Okay, um, so I would say um, one of the one of the challenges here is that uh, you know China was inwardly really focused, right? Uh, and the amount of venture capital in China is massive, uh, 80, 90 billion US dollars a year. Uh, as recently as like three or four years ago, um, you know, to VC investment in China was like five times larger than Europe combined, right? Um, and the rest of Asia is a rounding error compared to China. Uh, so um, so the the uh, I guess the, the the focus has been on the domestic market. Um, there's about six billion a year from China invested in Silicon Valley. Uh, that's been basically blocked uh, by CFIUS and, and concerns there. So nobody's taking any Chinese money. Um, there's a huge inflow over the last three four years into China into India. Uh, that's now been blocked. Uh, so the way I think about it, uh, like in the old days, we used to have blocks, and now with COVID, you know, I, I use the word bubble. But we've got bubbles. And before we used to have the China bubble and China's got their own Internet and it's a separate Internet. Uh, and then, you know, Europe created their own bubble with GDPR, uh, but it's a pretty big bubble. And then now we have the U.S. was in, in danger of getting into its own bubble. Um, we'll see what happens now. India is definitely its own bubble because there's no China allowed in India uh, except through uh, existing investments. And those are the largest uh, internet companies in, in India. So you have a bunch of different bubbles. And what we do as investors is we help startups pierce through the bubble. Uh, it's increasingly hard to go between these bubbles now. Um, there are different internets. There's different payment platforms, different laws. And it's very difficult for small companies uh, to penetrate bubbles. So what you have is the big getting bigger. That's why we have big internet. And it's increasingly challenging for startups. So on the one hand, you know, it's easier to get going because there's lots of tools like Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud. But on the other hand, because of regulation and, and uh, basically political concerns and, and walls going up and, and uh, uh, move away from globalization, uh, it's tougher. Um, so uh, just have to be aware of these bubbles. And how do we, you know, as investors or you know, leaders or thought leaders, uh, make sure that we can try and make it flat? Because uh, right now it's not. Yeah. Now, you know, frankly speaking, you know, again, I'm sorry to say this, but we are a net beneficiary of uh, the India-China thing, you know, really. Look, uh, from Karachi to Gwadar is 600 miles of coastline, 600 miles of coastline, out of the six, sorry, 600 kilometers of coastline, out of the 600 kilometers, 400 kilometers of beaches. Right. Okay. So now we've got a company out of Europe, which is planning a bullet train between uh, Karachi and Gwadar on a BOT basis. Right. And the BOT basis over a 25 year period. Now, when you've got these, this corridor going uh, along the coastline, right, there will be enough space for them to build, you know, actually new townships and new industrial uh, this thing. Sim similarly on the pattern that the Chinese did initially. Now, you, obviously, you have a lot of capital available now. And the fact is, the labor cost in Pakistan is the lowest in the entire region. That is, in South Asia, it is the lowest, right? 
in the re region. So just imagine if you've got new townships going up, if you've got capital from places like Hong Kong or China, etc., coming in long term, where they have the things they can make townships and they can make industrial townships, grow, grow it up on the pattern that uh, you know you you had these economic zones. If you got that, that this all in the works, it will happen because with uh, with uh, people with with uh, low cost labor cost and with available uh, uh, communication and with the sea coast making for a wonderful uh, you know ur urban planning thing you can imagine right because you know it's you cannot imagine you know i i mean i'm i'm 25 years ago somebody uh, you know came to me and said there's a one mile of beach in the middle of nowhere, you want to buy it, and it was for a for absolutely uh, you know for a song. I said, "What the heck?" You know, and my, my son was, lives in New York and is a lawyer. He told me, "He says it's a, it's a scam. You're taking it for right." I agree with him. It, it, at that time, it was a scam, right? No, it's not now. That that one mile of beach is a hell of a lot of property, and if you go and see that beach. You will give up on beaches all over the thing because it's a real beach, and with the weather, with the weather, which there is no rainfall there for uh, um, uh, for three hundred and thirty days of the year, right? So you've got sunswept beaches. You got the Indian Ocean, uh, right, right? The thing absolutely coming in, and you've got etc. coming. So you know, if you look at it. You know the, the wide open spaces that are available, and it's not confined to uh, Pakistan. I tell you, Afghanistan also is going to come up. Iran, of course, you know, has got its own problems. But uh, uh, the thing is that it opens up Central Asia. You know, you can think of the North South Corridor, right? If you if you think of uh, you know from uh, you know uh, right from Uzbekistan. And the railway line comes down, in fact, to Kandahar. And Paris. So, so, obviously, this has to be upgraded. It has to be uh, done. A lot of work has to come out. But the potential is there. The opportunity is there. Right, and if you're looking places where investment, you know, when you're having places where, you, like, you know, let's say it about India, right? A lot of investment has gone into India, but now, uh, like, uh, you know, you talked about, Wayne has talked about that investment uh, because of the problems between India and China, the investment has almost grown up. Where will that investment go? It'll go to the places where there's likelihood of a good return. Right. So I think if you look at it, you know, we are very lucky. And actually, you know, we think that the greatest thing that can happen in this region is a peace between Pakistan and India. Because peace between Pakistan and India would mean that the entire Southeast Asia, South Asia to start with, and the entire Southeast Asia would be connected to the BRI and to CPEC. And can you imagine if a, if a, if a truck can load or a, a container can load in a railway line in Calcutta, right? Or in Chalna port or in Chittagong port and go right up to Paris, right? Can you imagine said that, but, you know, obviously this is into the future. But what I'm saying is that there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of excitement, right? And, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, in fact, I, I really, really, the, the thing, I'm very glad that the Europeans who are coming in with this BOT project, right? And and they are because of them, other people are thinking about, uh, you know, with them coming in and, you know, et cetera. So there are opportunity here. And I think that opportunity for investment, right? Investment, which is worthwhile. We had a problem. We had a terrorist problem, right? That problem has been eradicated almost. It has not yet finished. They're still there, but it has been almost eradicated. It's not the same that it was 15 years ago not the same it was t 10 years ago, not the same it was five years, excuse me, five years ago. Now we have come down to a level with just stray incidents here and there. 
which is there in every country of the world, I think almost. So I think that we are now, because of CPEC, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, and because of VRI, uh, you know, there's a world of opportunity, not only in Pakistan, but for the adjacent region. Thank you. So, Wayne, how do you see, with all these now excitement in, um, in Eurasia, uh, uh, from the US perspective, do they see um, BRI, not you personally, but no, from the US perspective, do, do they see BRI as a threat to the free world, the developed world, as a, really a vehicle for geopolitical expansion of China? How, how, what are some perspectives in the U.S. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of rhetoric about China wanting to dominate the global stage. However, I believe that is just a byproduct of taking care of its domestic challenges of managing 1.4 billion people. I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative, in my view, is necessary to decouple the dependency on the Pacific trade routes, especially with the U.S., and strengthen the ties but, you know, what China needs, which is the natural raw, raw resources uh, from the western and central regions of Asia. I mean, China is already the number one foreign direct investment into the western borders of the Middle East and Africa. And, you know, I think it's the main strategy is to stabilize the population. I mean, it's, it's the strategy for the cultural revolution. Seaboard uh, and trying to keep them to stay behind and build out the industries in their hometowns in the western interior of China. I mean, 10 million people are being urbanized every year in China, and that that uh, growth. trying to do is you know, replicate Shenzhen, which grew from a sleepy town of 10,000 to a mega city of 10 million. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, I think, will bridge China's primary investments in Africa and the Middle East, as well as access to a larger but fragmented uh, markets of Europe, you know, Africa and the Middle East, and bypassing a lot of the political and economic challenges that were imposed by the Western powers, such as the United States. Um, this will Obviously, hopefully, you know, rebalance the, the, the imbalance of trade and then, you know, de-escalate the trade wars between China and U.S. And hopefully it will harmonize the balance not only over the Pacific, but also, you know, along the ancient trade routes that China made, that made China great. Uh, thank you, Wayne. Uh, we have maybe two or three minutes um, before we wrap up. Uh, I think to you know, all of you maybe you now each one of you can just just take one minute and say what do you see are the you now key you know, investment themes opportunities to see that is presented by Belt and Road. Maybe some of you first, uh, Ikram. <laughs> Ikram, please maybe just one minute on what you see. One minute, see the the key investment opportunities presented by I think the, um, the, the major in, um, investment, like I've said earlier, basically is in communications, transportation, right? That is the major investment. But I think uh, basically, uh, you know, we are looking at the beginning of, you know, like, uh, you know, Klaus Schaub says, at the fourth industrial revolution. And I think this can become the hub of the fourth industrial revolution. You know, this region can become. Because remember, there are a lot of skilled workers here. There are a lot of people in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, they think there are skilled workers. Or now, and now even the UAE and Iran uh, or Turkey, they're skilled workers. So you already have a base capital. You're not looking, you're not going into this thing. And then, you know, I, I want to go back to something about. Uh, you know, it's, I think we never felt threatened by China, never in Pakistan, never felt by, overwhelmed by China. 
that we've never been dictated to as our policy or something like that. You know, we have, you know, always had a very interesting relationship. You know, you are, you are in normal relationships, you have hiccups, something like that. But we've never, even over the last 50 years, I cannot think of anything uh, really substantial that has ever affected our relationship, either economically or politically. So that's that's our experience. We, we had a this thing, etc. And and by the way, you know, we really want, we don't want this uh, development to con confine to China. We want that the European nations to come in, and and most importantly, we want the United States to come. In. The United States must come in. They cannot leave a vacuum here. They cannot do the same thing that happened in Afghanistan, uh, you know, in in 1990. You know, you leave a vacuum. Etc. Et then you will create by default. You create a dominant force by default if you do not engage. So that is my two words. Thank you, Wayne. A few words from you. Like I, like I said, I think the investment opportunities are definitely in infrastructure in the western and interior of China that connect to the west rest of uh, the Middle East and Africa as well as Eastern Europe. Great. And uh, William. You have the final words. Yeah, sure. I, I just um, just be very aware of uh, you know just how competitive the China market is. Um, you know, you, you started off with many companies, like five to six thousand companies, and say ride sharing, and you end up with like uh, two companies, or and then and then one company. It's an extremely uh, you know hot crucible, uh, and when those companies start to go out. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, there, there's the local competition generally has very little, uh, to defend themselves with. Um, so there's a huge amount of money, amazing technology and, and super fast speed. Um, so, uh, there's on the, there's of course the political side, there's government initiatives. Um, uh, but the, the companies themselves.